everyone and welcome to the second day of our Futures at U92 event, which is a big focus on media today. I hope you're all well. Remember to pop your uh, kind of questions and have a little bit of a chat in the chat box and I'll be able to pick them up throughout the day. Today we've got a really exciting uh, series of events. So we have, for first of all, uh, an interview with our brilliant sports journalist, Bill Jones, who is also an associate tutor on our sports journalist course and has had a really kind of varied career working for the likes of BBC, CNN, working um, at Trackside at the Olympics, interviewing the likes of Jessica Ennis Hill, Usain Bolt, and he'll be talking about his career today and giving some top tips about entering the industry and also giving some of his career highlights too. Then 11 till 12, we have a Focus on Your Future session with Kyle Walker, the broadcast um, journalist for Man City. He kind of works on Man City TV. He works for uh, Sports Bible, BBC. He has a radio um, show on BBC Manchester as well. So that's a really exciting kind of session with, with Kyle. And he'll be talking about, again, his career path, tips for the industry, and some top tips for students that uh, for the skills that they can start to kind of embody right now. We have an hour lunch break where you can chat to our students on Unibuddy and then in the afternoon we have a 1 to 1.45 media and journalism course taster where you'll hear more about the courses at UN92 but you'll also have a chance to be part of our mobile journalism session and you can get some brilliant uh, skills to become a kind of a roving mobile journalist. And we also have a really exciting employability session with Enterprise and they'll be talking about interview techniques, specifically virtual interview techniques which is kind of a new skill that we've had to hone this year during the pandemic and they'll be giving you some really really great tips on kind of acing those virtual interviews too. We then also have two on-demand content um, live on our YouTube channel that you can kind of watch. So there's a student life talk with UN92 student Millie, who's a second year medium communication student and we also have our LinkedIn workshop with Microsoft too. So without further ado, I'd love to introduce our um, first session, which is a UN92 interviews Phil Jones. And our interviewer for today is Maya Reeves, who is our first year sports management student. Again, if you have any questions, just pop them in the chat and uh, Maya will pick them up at the end of the session too. But without further ado, I'd love to pass over to Maya and Phil. Hi everyone. I'm Naya. I'm a first year uh, student here at UN2 who does sport management uh, and also a student ambassador. So I'm joined by Phil Jones. Um, hi Phil, are you all right? I'm good, May. Yeah, are you? Yes, thank you. Do you want to start by telling us a bit about what you've done and who you are? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, at the moment, I'm working at UN92 and as associate tutor, as Katie just mentioned, working predominantly on sports journalism, but also on the journalism course and sometimes on the media and communications course as well. Um, my background in journalism and broadcasting is something like 30 odd years long and old. Um, I started out uh, at a press agency and I worked um, for local newspapers, local radio, and kind of made that progression through until I worked in television and then worked behind the scenes at the BBC, BBC Sport, went to work for CNN where I was a, a presenter there for about eight years and did something like 2000 shows for them. And then I came back to the UK, again, working for BBC Sport mainly, uh, but also sometimes Eurosport. Um, and for the BBC, I was the trackside reporter at the Olympic Games, um, presented a few programs as well, um, and worked at Wimbledon for, for many, many years, both for American TV and for the BBC. So that's kind of a potted version of my, of my career. Sounds really interesting. So you said your first jobs were very local, but like, what was your first job in like the industry that you were um, in, like the media industry? Yeah, I just, I was distracted because I, I got a, a question popped up already. Um, so I want to us to both keep tra track of, one of them was about the atmosphere at the London Olympics. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit later on. Okay. Um, Sorry, Maya, I was distracted. All right. So where, um, you were talking about your first jobs, you started local. Yeah. Uh, what was your first job like in the media industry? My first job was for a press agency. It was called the David Burke Press Agency. And it was, I'm from Salford, and it was in Salford. And I was at, um, 
and then I did an NCTJ course, the National Council for Training of Journalists, which is a one year thing in Sheffield. And I was just coming to the end of that. And I had a few interviews lined up at local newspapers. And it was maybe around exam time that I got a phone call. It was a bank holiday Monday, so I happened to be home in Salford. And it was this guy, David Burke, and uh, he needed, I'd gone to college with his sister and we knew each other to say hello to, to wave to. And he said, I believe, my sister tells me you were going, going to be a, a journalist or do a journalism course. Do you know anybody that would be interested in a job? And I went, yeah, me. <laughs> he thought I think I'd been at college um, the year before and was already working, but that wasn't the case. And so I went to meet him and within an hour or so, had a job and it was so bizarre. So that's one of the things I always say to the students that sometimes it's, 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 it's a lot of luck involved in getting a break, you know, and who you know and that kind of thing that can definitely help you. And in this instance, it helped me massively. And it was uh, an agency that did both sport and news. It did more sport than news. So that fed into what I, I liked as well, which was great. It was like perfect for you. You just sort of like fell on your feet in terms of like leaving. You got a phone call and it was like, oh, perfect. Yeah, and I, and I honestly, I could walk. It took me 10 minutes to walk where he lived from where I lived. It was so bizarre. And and the job came with uh, a company car. Which it was a, a, a phenomenal start for me, I have to say. Yeah. So what made you become a sports journalist then? Like, was there something that almost like flipped the switch and you thought, that's something I'd really want to do? Yeah, I, th I, th I think it was born of I love sport I love all kinds of sport I love to watch it and I like to play it and I was pretty good at tennis I played tennis at quite a decent level um, but I don't think I was ever going to be you know Andy Murray level so um, you know what's the next best thing if you can't play it on the biggest stage is to go and cover it on the biggest stage that's what I thought so I thought well if you know I loved Wimbledon loved athletics football well if I can't do it to a that level maybe I can go and cover it and yeah. you know see what it's like from that side not ever imagining that I would actually get to Wimbledon I thought I'd get some football games and some rugby games and things like that didn't think I'd end up working at Wimbledon 20 odd times and you know all the things that I've ended up doing but yeah at that point I think that was it just the passion for sport and, and trying to translate that into a career really I suppose for you then as well, seeing as you're like such a wide range, like you get to look at it from so many different perspectives. So like you, if you were to become like something in like tennis, then you wouldn't be able to like experience what it's like in all the different other sports. Yeah, yeah, I've had a wide, I've covered some amazing things through the, through the years, you know, some, some um, you know, ringside at big fights like a Joe Calzaghe world title fight and, you know, the Olympics, Commonwealth Games, I covered the World Cup for CNN, and you know, yeah, lots. Yeah, it's great to get a wide, a wide spectrum of events to cover if you possibly can. You know, a lot of people do hone in towards um, a latter parts of their career, and I, I suppose I, I sort of did that in that I ended up doing athletics and tennis pretty much predominantly towards the end. But that's a choice I I made as opposed to something that was imposed on me. I didn't really want to work in football, say, for example. Um, I'd, I'd done a little bit of that. And um, yeah, I just, I preferred the characters in other sports. Let's just put it that way. Right. So if someone wanted to do what you've done in your career, what advice would you give them? Well, at the very outset, it's important to have a passion for what you do. So, you know, don't go into political journalism if you're into sport and vice versa you know you go, go go down the road that that interests you and if you've got a really wide area of interest and you're not sure where you want to go in the end then you can do a general journalism degree as opposed to a, a sports journalism degree and get a grounding in other things like news journalism um you know court reporting and that kind of thing um and then just practice as much as you can really i mean i you know, and I say that in that you can you don't need to be employed by anybody to to write. You can write and practice your writing. You can watch a TV and watch a match and do a, your own match report and compare it to what BBC Online did or Sky Sports Online did. See what was in the paper the next 
day how the Telegraph tackled it, how did the Manchester Evening News tackle it, and compare and learn that way. Uh, I'll say to students, you know, if, you, if you're so inclined, start a blog and write that way. And, and if you can at that point, hone in on the basics. I'm big on the basics because they're so important. You know, it's a really big turnoff if your spelling, your grammar and that kind of thing are not good as a journalist and you in the written word and also with the spoken word you know you even if you're if you're broadcasting your spelling doesn't need to be accurate per se when you're just when you're saying the words but you need to have a decent script you need to have written something well you need to understand detailed information and disseminate it so i think it's really important to, at the outset as well so when you're practicing that you're getting those kind of basics right and going okay well they they use kind of language that kind of terminology what um what have i done wrong or what what do i need to adapt in order to make mine better or make it work um more like a you know an online story or a print story so they'd be the basic bits of advice because once you get onto a course like the one at ua92 obviously you're gonna have all your talents honed into all these different areas and you do everything from podcasting to presenting to interviewing to you know it's 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 a vast array of stuff that you learn um but initially you can just kind of top yourself up up with a few basics i think and and writing is the thing i always say just practice your writing right so let me turn that back round on you then so what was the best bit of advice that you've ever been given that's um, you? yeah that's that's a good one i think um Best bit of advice, I suppose, you know, I think a couple of things spring to mind. So I'll, I'll go with the thing. It's always the best way to, to go with the first thing that comes to mind, really. I remember one of the producers I worked with, an executive producer on The Athletics, called Martin Webster, sadly no longer with us. He was a, a great guy and a, a really top producer. Uh, and I was presenting from the mix zone, kind of the interview area for the, for the morning sessions of a of a world athletics championships in japan in osaka and the first day um it was a marathon that was then trans transitioning into a track event so the end of the marathon start of a track event and so as i came into the mix zone where our pre presentation area was jonathan edwards was my guest a triple jump uh, olympic champion a world record holder and um yeah rather embarrassingly we were late the marathon had kind of the the brits had gone through and we got our timings wrong basically and then we were held up because you had to have these armbands to get into the mix zone and we didn't have the right ones we had to go back to the office and then but it was just a bit chaotic so by the time i got there i literally had something like 10 seconds to plug in and go live on air to present the next bit of the show my scripts were in my bag somewhere over there Jonathan wasn't in position. It was just, ah, oh, it was horrific. So I, I just thought, you know, the, the, the world was over at that point. Um, and even though it was going out late in, in the UK, it was something like midnight at that point, you know, there's still an audience. Uh, and it never looks as bad as you think, but you just at that point think it's absolutely terrible. So it's Martin Webster who just said to me later on as I was ranting and raving about it, um, forget it, it's done. There's nothing you can do about that. And if you carry on like that, it's going to affect everything else you do going forward. Just switch off, forget about it. And so that's kind of, um, I, I use this on an, an applicant's open day the other day about Maya Angelou quote, the American poet who, you know, uh, to paraphrase it, she, she says, I did then what I knew how to do. And when I learned better, I did better. That was one of the things she used to always advocate. And, I, and that's a good thing to live your life by, I think, because if you have regrets and you worry about things and things that have gone, you can't control that, but you can learn from them. So I think that's, that's the best bit of advice. Just forget it, park it over there, do whatever you need to do to dismiss it. That, doesn't, that one moment doesn't define you. It's just a mistake. We're all gonna make mistakes or we're all gonna turn up late at some time. I didn't do it on purpose, obviously. So it's, it's um, yeah. That's what I would say is the best bit of advice. I suppose like if you learn from it, then that's all you can do in that situation. Like it was it was something that was like out of your control. You didn't realize. So 
yeah. that's, that's a skill in itself being able to move on from it and not like dwelling on it like you said yeah and that's and that's a learned thing as well that comes with experience i'm not saying it's a flick of a switch and you can do it but it's trying to train yourself to do it so you don't get hung up on it and it and it affects everything else you do um you know some of the best presenters i've ever been have made have made huge mistakes Des Lynham was one of the best presenters that BBC, uh, BBC Sport ever had. And he, they came to him to do a promo for the 1990 World Cup live and he froze, he didn't, didn't get any words out. And he was such a celebrated and you know amazing presenter. Things happen, you know, and just for whatever reason, you brain fog or you, you, know, you get your timings wrong, whatever it may be. So it is important to learn from the mistakes, but not be defined by them, yeah. So on a more like positive note then other than mistakes, like what was your proud what's been like your proudest moment or achievement of your career? Um I'm I'm we- I'm always wary of the word pride and being proud because it's like pride becomes before a fall, they say, don't they? Yeah. But um you know there are lots of things. I mean, I, rather than rather than proudest moments, I suppose um joyous moments or Things that I, you know, I think through my career and think, you know, working at CNN was a huge highlight and I had a fantastic time there. Working in America was a, was a great uh, ambition and, and I managed to achieve that. Um, and then uh, I suppose being part of the, the athletics team, uh, Martin Webster, I just mentioned, um, included when we won the BAFTA for TV coverage of the World Championship Athletics in 2009 in Berlin. And it had been such a fantastic event that we'd have all enjoyed so much to then be awarded uh, a BAFTA for that was, was fantastic as well. Um, and I suppose, you know, certain things like just, just as you're talking about proudest moments would be maybe more personal than, than you know, seeing, like I, I interviewed Jessica Ennis Hill when she was a junior and then I, to see her journey through to winning Olympic gold in London 2012 on that amazing Super Saturday. Um, likewise, Greg Rutherford, who I interviewed at the very outset when he won his first European Championship medal in Gothenburg. And then to have them come into the mix zone and be able to hug them and say, you know, well done before we got into the business of interviewing them. Uh, so I had lots of, pr- I suppose, proud moments like that as well. Um, making um i remember another one's come to mind when andy murray won wimbledon after that that long 70 odd year wait for a british male champion and he was coming to speak to sue barker in the studio and he had to come down this really long corridor so i went around the tv compound and said to people you know andy murray's coming down here soon we should have some kind of guard of honor for him and applaud him in so so people coming out of VT, editors, you know, whatever job you were doing at that point, everyone came out onto the corridor and he had to turn into the studio. So we, we were all kind of enveloping him, if you like, and gave him this big round of applause. You could see he was delighted, a bit sheepish, but, you know, he, he was just he, as joyous as he's ever been because um, he just won Wimbledon. <laughs> and that, that was great as well. I loved that. And he's, he'd always treated me really well. He's always been a good guy, and Andy, so I was absolutely thrilled for him, yeah. So what's the biggest misconception, then, of being a journalist? Like, what do people think it is, but it isn't? The, you know, the biggest bugbear for me in journalism is how it's depicted in TV, like in TV, crime dramas, and, well, everything, really. It's always... Um, they're always a kind of tabloid-esque kind of shifty characters who are doing no good the the, the other characters exist of course they do the tabloids exist um but it's only one tiny part of this whole journalism and media world i mean it's massive and there are so many more outlets than there ever were so that's that's a big misconception if and, and in fact when i was starting out a couple of uh tutors said to me both at school and college actually don't go into journalism it's a cutthroat business I'm not I wasn't cut out for it really uh, whatever they saw in me it maybe thought you know 
he's too soft or he's too whatever. I don't, I don't know. But you obviously I thought, it wrong. No. <laughs> well, it's just, I just thought, of, why can't you be a different kind of? Why do you have to be this horrible human being to to get on in the world of journalism? And 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 there are lots of fantastic people who do fantastic work. Um, and, and that includes on tabloid newspapers, by the way. Um, but obviously, there are there are some that give the give the profession a bad name. But I think that's an overall misconception, and it's kind of a lazy one when it comes to to TV and things like that. I think. Yeah, definitely. So, has there ever been a moment where you've worried it wasn't for you? So obviously, people have told you like it it's not for you but was there ever a moment in your like your heart that you thought oh maybe I've gone down the wrong path here like maybe this isn't really for me yeah absolutely there was and it was straight <laughs> straight before I started that job I mentioned at the very outset I was I'd done the the years course um in Sheffield on the NCTJ course and I was going for several interviews at several local papers as I mentioned earlier on and because I had a bit of work experience in some of these newspapers and I knew kind of what the next couple of years of my life would potentially be. It was doing things like back in the day, they used to say things you would be, you'd be the junior reporter, you do things like hatch, matched and dispatched, they call it. So that's hatched is births, matched is marriages and dispatched to the, is obits. So I wasn't going to be doing sport. I wasn't going to be doing the things I was passionate about. I was going to have to learn my trade, which is fair enough. Everybody has to do that to some degree. But I did question whether I had the, the drive and the passion for news to carry that through for the next couple of years to pass my proficiency test, which you, you'd have to do at some point, and then carry on doing news to get to a point where I could maybe cover sport. And I thought, have I, have I made the... The wrong decision here and I wasn't looking forward to doing the interviews really um I was kind of yeah I was thinking oh maybe maybe I'll do a because I've so not done a degree maybe I'll do a degree and buy myself more time is what I thought but then along came that job and the rest is history so you've obviously interviewed some amazing people like who are obviously like huge names but if you could interview anyone dead or alive who would you interview? Oh, there'd be a massive list. Yeah. There'd be a massive list of people. Um, dead, certainly, Winston Churchill, Nelson yeah. Mandela. Um, oh, Abraham Lincoln. Oh, can you imagine? So all the people, you, if you had the choice, yeah, they're, they're endless, probably. Uh, and people that are alive that I've not yet interviewed. Um, let me think. Oh, and, and certainly if people have done, the, yeah, Michael, Michael Jordan, I'd like to interview. I never interviewed him. Um, oh, I think you might have just lost Phil. Sorry. Hey, Maya, we can have a chat. Um, but I'll just try and get Phil to join as well. But remember, everyone can pop their, their questions in the chat for when we get Phil back. Um, but how are you doing the interview, May? Are you, are you getting all your questions answered? Yeah, I'm loving it. I was a bit nervous at the start, but like when I started, I was all right. <laughs> Good. Brilliant. Oh, I think he's left and then he's going to join back again. It's always an issue with kind of Wi-Fi and doing things virtually especially. Go on then, Katie, you've had interviewed people. Um, who, who would you most like to interview, dead or alive? Um, I think I would like to interview... Oh, that's a really good one. So, definitely... So, actually, um, Phil mentioned before, Maya Angelou. I'd love to have interviewed her. I think she's got a really interesting kind of story and history, and I think she'd be very, very interested. And it's always that kind of type of question of, like, who would you like to have at a dinner party? Um, I don't know. Actually, one person that I've always wanted to interview, and I'm actually interviewed on Friday as part of this week, is Andy Burnham. So um, I, I love Manchester, and I love Andy Burnham's kind of stance on kind of the North and how he feels about the North. That's really important. Hi, Phil. I'm back. 
your back. There's always a few technical hitches, but Maya dealt with it very well and started interviewing myself. So um, we'll get back on track and I'll leave you two to it. So I think the question was, who would you like to interview, dead or alive? Yeah, and I've, gi I've given you a, a little bit of a, a list, I think, already, Maya. Alive, it's, it's tricky, that one. I suppose... Um, um, the Queen would be a good one. Oh yeah, I didn't think about that. Yeah, the, some, some, um, I, I've interviewed Prince Harry, uh, and I suppose you know Oprah Winfrey's got the coup at the moment, hasn't she? With that, with the, uh, the Harry and Meghan interview coming up at the weekend. So, uh, oh, there'll be, I'm sure there are loads. But I was going, I was about to say I've been very lucky in that I've interviewed, you know, some great people like Usain Bolt and. Uh, Jess Ennis Hill, I mentioned already, um, you know, David Beckham, Bill Clinton when he was president, Al Gore when he was vice president, you know, that's so Pele, you know, I've been very fortunate. So, who's been your favorite person you've interviewed? Um, I, I always find that really difficult to, to answer because it just depends in what environment you're in. So, it's not like, like at Wimbledon. If somebody said to go and interview Roger Federer, I used to think, oh, brilliant, because Federer was always such a delight in an interview, but he'd also give you so much yeah. back. You didn't have to work too hard. You were just having, like we do now, we'd have a conversation, he'd answer fully, and, and he's such a gentleman. He is such a gentleman. Uh, and so in that context, it would be him, you know? So, you know, but then in another context, in the athletics world, any of the Brits that were winning medals and the joy that they they get, you know, they they kind of passed on to me, if you like, when they came through the mix zone. I used to love that. So, um, and yeah, and interviewing icons like Pele, yeah. you know, that was a, that was an amazing thing. So Bobby Charlton, he was my first celebrity interview, if you like, when I worked for the press agency, um, and I forgot to write my answers down I was a bit starstruck so there's a lesson learned as well um I could remember kind of what he was saying so I was able to make a story out of it but and it was a light story it wasn't a heavy story so I kind of got away with it but yeah he was another one that I ended up working more with when I was at CNN as well and he's he's a legend wow so you've worked at the BBC and CNN so obviously the BBC is in the UK and CNN is in the USA. Like, did you find there was much difference between like the culture, between like the environment and things like that? Yeah, I think, um, I think there are, there are some similarities within across TV, no, no question. And the way, um, you know, the studio set up and the, and the gallery and where the producer and editor sit and things like that. But there are, yeah, there are cultural differences. I noticed the biggest difference when I got to the States actually was how male dominated it was. Like, like there'd been a bit of a breakthrough in BBC Sport and that there was a female director working on main programs like Sports Night and sometimes Match of the Day and things like that. So that was, and also the secondary producer on Grandstand, which was the sort of flagship Saturday afternoon show, was also female. Uh, she, she actually was the one that gave me my first break to sit on set and practice. And, you know, so uh, her name's Sharon Lentz and I'll never, she's a friend to this day. Um, so um, it was a bit of a shock to my system when I got to the States and it was I mean, there maybe just one female assistant producer and one female kind of secretary in the office. And it was a very, very jock, jock type atmosphere, you know, that kind of, yeah. laddish kind of thing really so that was a that was a big cultural difference uh, and there were differences in I felt like CNN everything had to be a bit more punchy and a bit shorter and a bit I don't know it just felt like the American you know our, our attention span nowadays is meant to be eight seconds according to Microsoft if you're not interested in something in eight seconds you you move to something else so I think CNN were already kind of buying into that, that, you know, everything we did was short, punchy, short features, whereas I felt like the BBC had afforded me a bit more 
time. So that's that's the that's, that's that would be the main thing I think. Um, but you know, the nuts and bolts of it and what you need to do are, are the same. Yeah. Do you think you carried like things from one company to another in terms of like you learnt things in one place and sort of took them on and taught it on, if that makes sense, like passing on the knowledge? Uh, yeah, I, I suppose. <clears throat> you know what? What I did at CNM was I presented a, a daily show, a live sh show, half an hour of of sport. It's called World Sport. I'd not done that at all. But I did have the experience of sitting in a little booth with headphones on, reading a script to time in a pressurized situation for match of the day. I used to do the roundups on match of the day. Um, so, and, in, and for other sports as well, Wimbledon as well. So, so there you're in a very pressurized situation. So it's not massively different that you're reading you're just reading to a camera, you're reading your auto cue as a presenter. So I, I suppose I could adapt that to that. And, and obviously I developed some kind of writing skill for TV because it was very different than writing for newspapers. So you have to adapt your writing style. So when it came to writing features for CNN, I'd already done that for the BBC. So yeah, you can definitely carry that with you. Uh, but sitting there on set that first day and I'm doing a live show even though I had a little experience of sitting on set and doing that for world service TV, that wasn't live. It was recorded. You could make mistakes and you could go again and you make mistakes and go again. But this, it was, you've got to get it right. And it's, you know, I think the first show I did was 15 minutes. Actually, it didn't be, I was three months into my job at CNN before it came a half hour show. So it was 15 minutes initially. Um, well, that's a long time in TV, you know, just to be you and the camera and, um, so it was nerve wracking, but once I got through it, I thought, okay, I'll, I'll be fine. I'll be fine with this. It's not, you know, it's not finished me off, not killed me. <laughs> I suppose when your first one's out of the way as well, you think, oh, well, nothing too bad went on. So I should be all right. And then you get more and more. Yeah. And it was daily, which was great. I didn't have to wait till the next week to do it. I was doing it every day. So you, you, you can get better very quickly but it was, I would say it still took me months and months and months before I felt really com really comfortable and probably a year before I felt that I was really you know doing quite well or looked pretty good doing it you know it's it, it takes it still take time it wasn't like it was an instant thing but CNN saw something in me so they had trust in me and that helps as well if you've got somebody's backing um, they saw my potential so that was that was the key to it. I wasn't going to be fired after week two or something. So you said you like did different things. So in terms of like reading, um, uh, like things for like uh, over like voice over things, and you also did like uh, speaking to a camera. Did you have like a favourite thing or writing or writing has always been my favourite. Yeah. yeah, it has always been uh, because. Um, you, know, you can use it in so many different areas and so you need you need those writing skills whatever area of media you're working in really and and so if you're scripting something if you're writing something for a feature if you're preparing some questions you know writing writing is is what you do most predominantly so uh but i liked writing to pictures and writing to words and trying to make the so televisually i like trying to make the the pictures fit um, with my words and vice versa and try and be clever if I could. And, you know, a few funny little things. I used to try to do, did some bizarre things at, you know, at Wimbledon. It had been not a particularly great day. I was doing a roundup of events at Wimbledon. I'd always try and have a theme, you know, so be it um, on something that happened on that day in history and trying to weave that in. Or I remember one of those like being, you know, it was so many years since Alice in Wonderland was written. And so we did a whole Alice in Wonderland type uh, theme and we made certain players, the Mad Hatter and then, you know, graphics got involved. Yeah. So it's all that kind of stuff. Just, just being a big kid really, I suppose. And making it interesting for the people who were watching it almost. Cause however interesting the, the situation is, the, 
the more you push it, the, the wider audience. Because I suppose if you make Alice in Wonderland theme, you're going to catch, capture a younger audience. Like if children are watching it with their parents, they might switch off if it was just like a normal sort of graphic for whatever it was. But if like the Mad Hatter and Alice in Wonderland on the screen, that'll almost intrigue them, I suppose. Yeah, you, you, you're so right with that because, and that's what they used to drive me, drive me insane actually, the, the old Wimbledon round, roundups used to be so-and-so played so-and-so and da 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 da, -da and he, he did this and he hit this backhand and he hit that backhand then she did this and she did that and she won six three four six and stuff like that. dull 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 how can we change that what can we that so that was my thing always my thing how can I make it more engaging for an audience and have a theme and hook people in and just allow to play with music you know underlying music all, all those different things you're right and it, it brings in a different audience a non-sporting audience you might just casually view it and go oh well, that's that's you know not not bad. so I always I did that with the end of tournament roundups a lot as well where we'd um we, you know I'd always come up with a theme I did one with a hundred the hundred movie most famous movie quotes of all time and I got those into the script, but then made elements of the, you know, so we had a silent movie part with words written on the screen, like a silent movie. And then we had, um, you know, an action movie and a rom-com and a, you know, so all this kind of thing woven in within about a four or five minutes piece. Um, so it's, it was just, yeah, to make it, to make it engaging. Um, the couple of, couple of questions have, have popped up on here. Um, Kerry Will and, and Stacey Marsh. Uh, Kerry says, with so many ex-sports people going into sports journalism and presenting now, what does the future hold for new graduates or young people trying to get into the industry? Thanks. Uh, Kerry, that's a really, really good question. Um, you know, I think there's always going to be a place for, for proper journalists and proper jour journalism. That's what I would say, Kerry, first and foremost. For as many people who've been catapulted in from sport to work within the industry, um, you know, that have succeeded, there are also many that have failed. And the ones that have succeeded are the ones who've put the work in, I think. You know, there are exceptions to this, but um, somebody like Gary Lineker now is established as a TV presenter and, you know, is recognized as a, a very accomplished one. But in the early days, he wasn't, he knew that. He worked as a pundit first of all, and then he practiced the presenting and time was invested in him to, to get better at that. Um, and Jeanette Kwachi, who was an athlete who took over from me on the athletics, um, when I decided not to do it anymore, um, Jeanette studied, she went and did a course. She then went and worked with Channel 5. She did radio work she worked behind the scenes at athletics events interviewing people she got the background so I think that's great but if you're that person who's gone through a course you're not a sports star like Jeanette would be the first to say you know she wasn't the biggest name she reached the Olympic 100 meter final she was an incredible athlete but she wasn't Jess Ennis Hill or Denise Lewis or Colin Jackson she found another way to get it so she studied and she got in so the athletic ability and that side of her career helped in one way, I suppose, but ultimately it, you know, it didn't, if she couldn't do the job, which, you know, her name wasn't going to carry her, carry her on to do the job. So uh, if you look across people who are presenting on TV and you see, um, I would still say 70, 80% of them are, um, you know, I've got some kind of journalism background. Pundits, punditry is a different thing because you have to almost have been there and done that. But even then you see somebody like Guillaume Balaguer you know, on um, um, Sky Sports and Radio 5 Live, Spanish reporter um, being used as a pundit and he's a journalist first and foremost. Uh, it's just, it, the key is to get the best grounding you possibly can so I would say this to Kerry, if you just, you know, if you uh, study, work hard, hone your talents and put yourself in a position where you are going to be valuable to an organisation, 
um, then you know you can you can certainly make a name for yourself. You don't have to have been a sports star to to make it. You really don't. Um, shall I answer Stacey's question while we're on this as well? Stacey, Stacey said, "Have you ever had to change your preparation when interviewing an awkward sports star?" Um, yeah, I mean, I, sometimes you wouldn't know they were awkward till you interviewed them the first, you know, the first time. And then after that, you could make preparations accordingly. Um, there were some people that would answer very in a very quick staccato kind of fashion. So you almost had to have your next question ready. And so, but the first time you interview that person, you don't know that. So you could, could be going, oh, they finished, the, they finished their answer already. That was quick. And so you would, next time you go in thinking, okay, I better have two or three things in my mind in case they, have you ever come across that mail where somebody's talking to you and then they just stop abruptly and you think, oh, it sounds like they're going to go on. Their intonation suggested they were going to add something to that sentence and they've not, you know, that kind of thing. So that can happen in the journalistic world. Yeah. So there's one more question um, on the Q&A from Oliver. Yeah. He said, Hi, Phil, would you say it's possible to have a career change and get into journalism later in life? If so, what would be the best way to tackle this? Yeah, absolutely. I don't see any reason why not. Um, again, it stems from um, having a passion for something, I think, and if you and a knowledge of something. So if you've been doing something else in, a, in another career, <clears throat> but you are really into politics or sport or any kind of current affairs or anything like that, and you're pretty well versed in that, then I see no reason why you can't switch and go, okay, well, this is the career I've been doing. This is the one that I want to do. This is what, you know, floats my boat. I want to do this. I think the way to, the way to do that is, as I mentioned at the outset, something like um, starting your own blog or vlog and honing in your writing skills for definite. It's giving, it's for that next career move, it's proving to somebody else out there that you're serious about what you want to do or intending to do. And so it's it's giving them evidence and it's giving them evidence of your talents as well. So hopefully by honing your writing skills for starters, you can demonstrate to somebody else or would be employee, employer that, yeah, I can do this. I've got knowledge of this. Uh, yeah, it's trying to establish contacts, get yourself out there. Um, I mean, it's. It, I'm not saying it's any of this is easy, you know, it's, it's, it, but it's, if that's the goal um, and it's something that you, you're thinking about, then why not try? Why not go for it? Yeah, I think it is possible. I mean, it's, it's like me at this point in my life, you know, I decided not to carry on doing the job I was doing in 2017 because I've been doing it for so long and try and do other things. And there's, it's very hit and miss. There's some things I've tried and that not quite worked and other things that have. And, and the UA92 thing is a big career change for me. I've had to learn a lot in a very short space of time, but I'm armed with some knowledge that can carry me through, you know, my background, my experience. So if the, if the person who asked that question is, uh, as I say, passionate, interested, and has some semblance of talent, then it's a question of honing those those in um, and getting people to read your, you know, read your work. Um, if you want to go into the broadcasting side of things, you know, look at all of the, the those gradual steps you can make from hospital radio, local radio, um, there are the local TV stations that are around and about that um, want to take people that are raw that was a big government aim to have all these local stations and some of them because of financials, the financial situation have kind of disappeared bit by bit, but there are still some that are out there and you can be a really, uh, the most inexperienced journalist in the world and go and work for some, somewhere like that. If you, you know, get your foot in the door initially, show them that you can do it. Yeah. There are, there are various ways in. We've got a few more questions. So, is there a future project that you're really looking forward to? Um, future projects. Well, 
I've done, I did a I did a thing with um, Liam Payne used to be in One Direction uh, last year, um, where I got to spend the day with with Liam. We went back to his old school and um, his old house. Wandered around his old house with his mom and dad. That was really good. And so hopefully I'm going to do more with him. That was more for his website and for some of his on. He was doing stuff. For, for his online shows and things like that in the, during the pandemic um but that is something that opened another door to me i've not done anything in a kind of a light entertainment way before so that was that was great but the biggest focus for me is is going to be ua92 from the next academic year i don't know that i'll have much free time to do anything else to be honest from that point um and yeah i'm looking forward I've, I've, written a, a book with a former tennis player called John Lloyd, which is due out in 2022. Um, so that'll be, I'm looking forward to that finally coming out again, post pandemic and all the holdups. Yeah. So before I carry on to ask the other questions, um, you were talking about UA92 and obviously that that's a new thing for you, even though you're teaching what you know, it's a different environment. How did you find the change from the environment you were used to to coming into almost like a, a an education setting yeah so it was a big uh a big difference um it was a very warm and welcoming place yeah that's what i would say to anybody who's potentially going to go there if it, i don't know if you found the same mayor it's, yeah, yeah. Definitely. and it's um you've so I, there was an instant welcome but i i'd done it in bits and bits and bobs as well along the way i'd been to an open day there i got to meet a few of the people there um one of my one of my friends and bbc work colleagues knew somebody there so i had i had somebody i could go over and say oh i you know we've got a mutual friend you know to get to have an initial chit chat and so yeah that was really early early days but i liked the concept i liked the people so that was a big help but in terms of the environment and doing the the, the lecturing kind of side of things. Yeah, that's difficult. And, and because of the way UA92 is with the, the the lectures, the four hour lectures, the concentrated modules, there's a lot of work in each block. And so getting up to speed for me to be the expert to teach the students was 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 tricky, you know. I'm talking on the academic side of things here, not on my, you know, the professional side of things and the writing, I've got that nailed, but there's all kind of, you know, there's the academic side as well that I had to to brush up on. Yeah, like, and I suppose if you were to teach it just like on a whim, you would teach like probably lots of things that isn't on the curriculum, which have to incorporate in following like the content you have to put in, I suppose, as well. Yeah. From, from your aspect of, because you've got so much experience that you want to pass on, but you have to follow the, the set curriculum in the same sense. Like, so it's, I suppose it's like blended from the, the tutors at UA92. Yeah, and that's it, and that's adapting. That's what I, what I learned quite quickly is that it's adapting your skill set to work in that environment and how you can best help the students. I think being able to help them one-on-one, -on -one, a smaller class size has really helped. Yeah. It felt like I could pass on my experience even when we were sticking to a prescriptive thing for the, uh, for the module um, and, you know, the assessments. But even then, you know, for example, like mobile journalism was a part of introduction to journalism. Mm -hmm. So when the students are creating pieces of work for that, a lot of that was well, it's writing and scripting, it's voiceover work, it's pieces to camera. And so instantly I can pass on my knowledge to them. You know, so I was getting students to read to me one on one and just work on their intonation, work on their delivery that kind of thing. So um, yeah, it was it was a steep learning curve, I suppose, but I learned a lot in a short space of time. So we've got a few more questions. Okay. Um, so uh, Stacey said, there seems to be a lot more freelance journalism now. Do you think that there's, there is a cultural change towards freelance and do you think it will make it harder for young journalists to get into it? Yeah, I mean, you know, freelancers have always, I've always been around. I mean, the, the agency I worked for, 
David Burke's agency, David was a freelance journalist that then added staff the more work he got. And there were lots of agencies around and those agencies do still um, exist to some degree or another. Um, you know, a lot of, for example, court reporting, a lot of what court reporting uh, that you'll see in newspapers and things is farmed out to agencies. It's not done by one court reporter on one newspaper. Um, and a lot of sports coverage as well. And I'm thinking about, you know, to all intents and purposes, through a big, big chunks of my career for the BBC initially, I was a freelance as well. You know, I wasn't on staff. So I, I got a contract to do a certain amount of work, but I was putting myself there as a freelance. That's why I could work for Eurosport as well. And I worked for Satanta when they existed, doing the boxing for them and things like that. So, uh, so I suppose, um, I don't know how much, maybe there, are, there is more freelance journalism now, but I think there are more outlets now. When I was starting off, you know, there were the national newspapers, regional newspapers, uh, but there's no, no online. You know, now you've got, you know, if you, if you write, you can write for the Daily Mail newspaper or Mail Online. Yeah. And they're very, they're separate staff. They're not the same people. Um, and so regional, regional newspapers, local radio, um, the, 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 the local TV thing that I said that the government had set up in various areas around the country, that didn't exist. Um, and there's still a fair amount of investment in, in local reporting. You know, I think certainly BBC, um, local radio, um, BBC regional news is still, is still pretty, pretty strong. Um, so Stacey, I'm, I mean, I don't want to say it's going to be, you know, easy for anybody to get into any, it's, it's, it's so hard to say that, like, you know, go and do this, get this degree, you'll easily get into work. But what you've got to do is arm yourself with as much information as much knowledge as you can and as many skills as you can to take you forward into your chosen profession that's not that's that's not just journalism that's anything uh, and trying to you know trying to get a break and if you only need to look at bobby hagcraft who I, i've taught in this first couple of years uh, and bobby's already got a job in Ho um, the hornsey reporter i think it's called so she's doing that in conjunction with her degree which is brilliant but bobby has got talent she's doing lots of things as an ambassador for ua92 she gets herself out there she she you know and that and that's the key i would say stacy is make yourself visible learn as much as you can i've seen bobby interview gary neville on set i've seen her do all all manner of things even doing what you're doing today mayor is, is is that's all part of that learning curve and and um and then telling other people you've done it showing other people you've done it it's one thing to say you could be able to do it so it's, it's an entirely different thing to yeah. to have done it yeah i suppose as well now like with the social media presence that we, we we can build for ourselves almost like in our free time people who want to get into like the media side of the world in general like i, I suppose you can sort of start building your base now like how, whoever you are and wherever you're from like you can you can create a twitter an instagram and just build from there and I suppose if you do anything like this, if you write about it on places like that, then the more people see it, the more people think, oh, well, what are they doing there? And what are they doing? Do you understand what I mean? I know exactly what you mean. And social media, you've got to be really careful with, because you're right, you can use it as a good tool like that, but also make sure that when you're presenting yourself on, on social media like that, and you're using it as a platform that might help you in your career, or you want to develop your career through it, that you don't then also put your matey jokey fun. you've almost got to suddenly become a bit more professional in how you present yourself on social media and all the others to almost have a you know you have your private account and you have your public face um and so just be really aware of that i would say but it's a, yeah of course you can do that that's what i'm saying about doing a blog and do that's for you and your control and get it out there get people reading it um a would-be student sent a piece that he did just yesterday, which was really good. Um, uh, Harry, um, he's hopefully going to join us at UA92 at some point, but he 
asked Gary Neville, could he do an interview with him? And he did. And it's, he's written it up and it's going to go on um, an online thing called United, United We Stand, I think it's called. Right. Anyway, he's, he's done a, he'd already written one piece that had been published on that same website and showed us at the uni. We gave him feedback, which encouraged him. And, you know, yeah. that's another way. Tap into tap into us at UA ninety two. Send us some of the inf you know we we're always going to be there to help if we can. Yeah, definitely. Right. Thank you very much for speaking to me today. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, me too. Thanks yeah. a lot, Maya. Thank you. Both and well done, Maya, for your first kind of official interview. Um, you did very well. Even Kerry on the chat is saying well done. Huge well done to Maya. So you should be very proud of yourself. And thank you, Phil, for giving your time and talking about your career path. You've had such a varied career. It's just lovely to hear about those different like types of uh, job roles that you've done. And I'm very jealous that you got to be at the Olympics 2012. That's <laughs> I'm always asking you about it and asking you yeah. what you say Bolt is like and stuff. And I don't think I fully answered that question that was early doors about, about London 2012 and the experience, but needless to say, it was amazing and a career highlight and, you know, goosebumps were a, a regular occurrence there with that crowd. So, yeah. So, okay. so well, apologies for not answering that question earlier. <laughs> it's okay. I'll ask you when I next see you on campus. It's okay. <laughs>